What did he know? He talked like a Texan, and anybody knows that if you talk like a Texan, you must be stupid. <laughs> well, just consider the reaction of much of the media to the current president. After all, my gosh, if you're going to say nuclear, he can't know anything, right? Well, Lyndon Johnson, by the estimate of the people who knew him best, including some Ivy League types, was one of the most intelligent individuals they'd ever encountered. Eric Goldman, a history professor at Princeton, who knew Ivy League types, who had known other presidents, once described Lyndon Johnson as possessing more mental firepower than anybody he had ever encountered. He thought Johnson was simply scary, smart. Well, but Johnson always felt at a disadvantage to what he liked to call those Harvard types. Those Harvard types who thought they knew everything and who couldn't stand Texans. And I have no idea what the perception of Texas is in Michigan generally. I will say that my reception at Grand Valley has been as friendly and welcoming as can be. Maybe it's because I'm not from Texas. I, I don't know how Michiganers look at Texas. But I do know that there are a lot of people who just, they hear Texas and it just, they're just kind of put off by the idea. And Johnson felt this. Johnson also realized that all of those people who loved John Kennedy, and there were a lot of people who loved John Kennedy, felt that he was a usurper. Maybe they didn't blame him directly for the assassination, although some did. They still thought that he had stolen the place that was supposed to be occupied by John Kennedy. And there, as I say, there were a lot of people who loved John Kennedy. Historians and political scientists often rank presidents. And when they rank presidents at the top are Lincoln, Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, and then below that, Harry Truman, oh, that's Theodore Roosevelt. Some people still will include Andrew Jackson in the top 10. John Kennedy ranks around 20 <coughs> in terms of the impact that he had on American life. But when you ask the question to the public at large, just popularity ratings of presidents, Kennedy is right up there with Lincoln. Kennedy remains beloved. How do we know Kennedy remains beloved? Well, who do you think Barack Obama is modeling his campaign on? Who does he want to be seen as? The new John Kennedy. And there are some interesting parallels there. Okay, so Johnson comes in burdened with his own sense of inferiority. And this is a complicated thing because Johnson knew he was smart but he didn't know how smart he was. And he thought that other people were looking down on him. And if enough people look down on you, then you start to question your own ability. He knew perfectly well that the Kennedy crowd hated him. And he knew perfectly well that Bobby Kennedy absolutely despised him. And Bobby Kennedy was plotting to remove him from office and take the position himself. Okay, so there's all of this that's going on in Johnson's mind. What can he accomplish? He can do something that John Kennedy never could have done. John Kennedy started to do, but didn't get anywhere on him. That was reform the race question in the United States. John Kennedy himself, for some of the same reasons as Franklin Roosevelt, hesitated to get behind civil rights legislation. This after the, board of, the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, which mandated the desegregation of schools. This after the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955. This after the sit-ins that began in 1960. This after the March on Washington by Martin Luther King in 1963. It was only after that that Kennedy supported the introduction of a civil rights bill in Congress. And the bill, as long as it had Kennedy's name on it, went nowhere. Why not? Because Southerners, the ones who still held positions of influence, were not about to be lectured to by some Massachusetts liberal. No. Civil rights reform was going to require a Southern president. Southerners might listen to a Southerner, 
They wouldn't listen to a northerner in very much the same way that somebody outside a family is not allowed to criticize members of the family. The family pulls together when outsiders start poking their noise, noses in, but when the outsiders are gone, then the family, they can be just as critical as you want to be of each other. And that's the way it was with Johnson. And this is where the catch-22 that I was talking about fits in. The civil rights system, or more precisely the Jim Crow system in the South, could not be reformed until a Southerner was president. Because the South, and in the Senate, it only takes a minority to filibuster and to block legislation. And the South could block legislation on civil rights. They could only be persuaded to give way if a Southern president told them it had to be done. But a Southerner could not become president as long as the Jim Crow system persisted in the South. How do I know this? Well, how many Southern presidents were there between the Civil War and the 1960s? Well, a half of one, if you count Woodrow Wilson, who was born in Virginia, but lived his adult life in the North. Okay, so he was, and he only became president because the Republican Party split in 1912 when Theodore Roosevelt walked out. But no other Southerner could get elected president. Why not? Because to rise up in politics, you have to have a state and local base first. Nobody gets to drop into the political race from the top unless, unless you're a general. If you're a general like Dwight Eisenhower, if you're a general like Ulysses Grant, you don't have to have come up the ladder. You can come in from the top. But if you're not a general, you have to have a local base. To have a local base in the South, you had to cultivate those very white supremacists who opposed civil rights legislation. And by the time you rose to the level of national visibility, you had so much baggage behind you that you were never a viable candidate. Not only did Southerners not get elected president between the Civil War and the 1960s, they didn't even get nominated for president. They didn't even get nominated, they, they rarely got nominated for vice president. Lyndon Johnson only got nominated for vice president because John Kennedy thought he would decline the offer to join him on the ticket. But Johnson surprised him and said yes. So Lyndon Johnson becomes president at the end of 1963. And he immediately he makes it part, well, he makes it his first priority to get civil rights reform passed. Why? This is where the mixed motive comes in. It was partly because Lyndon Johnson wanted to be important. Lyndon Johnson wanted to be remembered by history. And he knew that, as I suggested earlier, whoever pushed civil rights legislation through Congress would be considered the modern heir to Abraham Lincoln, who would have completed the revolution that Abraham Lincoln started. So that was, that was part of it. Johnson had a towering ego. Oh boy, I'm tempted to tell that story about Johnson. The, who, who's here and has heard my joke about Lyndon Johnson? No? Okay. <laughs> well, if, how many of you have visited Austin? Have you visited the Johnson Library? The Johnson Library is a little bit more, how many of you have been to Ann Arbor and visited the Ford Library? Uh, those of you who've seen both, uh, which is a little bit more, shall we say, intimidating? <laughs> the Johnson Library looks like a mausoleum. It's this enormous thing that rises up beside I-35 on the edge of the campus of the University of Texas. That gives you an idea of the size of Lyndon Johnson's ego, but this story does too. Thank <laughs> you.